classic character alignment system has two axes, the good versus evil axis and the law versus chaos axis. Each axis is actually a spectrum. It runs from an extreme on the one end to neutral in the center to the opposing extreme on the other end. A character or creature exists at a certain point on each of these spectrums. Many can and do shift along these axes throughout their lives as they go through personal changes. Some creatures, however, such as demons or angels, are so intrinsically bound to their essence that they never shift in alignment, except in some extremely rare cases. Other creatures have no alignment, aka unaligned. This is usually the case for creatures such as animals or maybe a basic slime. It operates just on pure instinct. It has no conscious decision-making faculty. Unaligned basically means that the subject cannot truly exist in the realms of morality, ethics, philosophy, and religion. We're going to take a look at law and chaos and also their relationship to good and evil. But before I dive in too deep, I first want to thank everybody who has subscribed to my channel. I recently hit 100,000 subscribers and that really meant the world to me. I've been working on producing content since 2009 and it's been a really long journey with many different twists and turns. Reaching this milestone is just so incredible. If you're not yet subscribed, please take a quick second and do so now. I make videos about Dungeons & Dragons, role-playing, adventures, fantasy stories. Here or there I do a bardic work of creative experimentation. Also, don't forget to hit the like button. Show some support for your brave companion here. Good versus evil tends to get more attention than law versus chaos. I suspect this is because the effects of good and evil are so clear and so strongly felt, especially at the far ends of that spectrum. Much of our formation as human beings, especially in our first few early years of life, has to do with learning right from wrong and these types of good behavior and bad behavior. We are also taught law versus chaos or order versus chaos, but in general this axis is not quite so explicit. It's not as strongly felt as good and evil, and there's also some key differences with how it plays out in the world. There is a tendency to associate order with good and chaos with bad. Consider the following pairs of statements. My life is in order, meaning my life is functioning well. I'm on top of everything. My life is in chaos, meaning my life is dysfunctional and it's out of control. The airport was in order meaning the airport was well organized and operating according to schedule. The airport was in chaos. The airport was disorganized, overcrowded, hectic, and operating poorly. In examples such as these, it's obvious to see why we would very much prefer order or law. Life functions well when there's structure, orientation, maintenance, and peace. Conversely, Life does not function well when there's confusion, disorientation, disrepair, and turmoil. But things are far more nuanced than this. What if the order is so much that everything is predictable? Consider these pairs of statements. The movie was completely predictable. That means the movie lacked entertainment because there were no surprises and it was devoid of originality. The movie was completely unpredictable. The movie was surprising, shocking. It had constant twists and turns. The book's protagonist does the same thing every single day. So in that case, the character is terribly monotonous. The book's protagonist does something unexpected all the time. Well, here we know the character's a wild card. They're always surprising you. You'll notice that a common theme in these examples is stories. The first was a movie and the second was a book. This means that chaos, to some degree, makes for interesting stories, or it at least gives us the material for a story. This actually includes our own lives as well. 
for we are story-based creatures. You are living out your own story. You're part of a larger scale story that involves your country, your community, your culture, and the time period in which you live. You tell people stories and you hear other people's stories all the time. We use narrative structures to convey information and really to make sense of the complexity of existence. Despite our differences and our variations, all humans share many common needs. Two of these needs are the need for stability and the need for new experiences. We can also frame this as the need for structure and the need for change. Each person varies to some amount in terms of how much they need of each of these elements, but both are present. If you have no stability, you are going to break down and get swallowed by the never-ending challenges of life. If you have no new experiences, you are going to become a dull, numb, petrified thing that lacks the dynamics and the variety of stimuli necessary to be fully alive. Here are some keywords specific to law and chaos and how they contrast against each other. Known, unknown, predictable, unpredictable, codes and rules, whims and impulses, discipline, caprice, orderly, erratic, restricting, uninhibiting, prediction, surprise, conditioned, wild, building, adventuring, tradition, rebellion, caution, risk, dependable, temperamental, settling, wandering, training, cavorting, defining, blurring, harmony, discord, forthrightness, trickery, facts, emotions, plans and strategies, dreams and wishes. There are pros and cons to both sides. If order is taken too far, it petrifies, it paralyzes, it imprisons. A person becomes overly rigid, even mechanical. If chaos is taken too far, it drowns, it disintegrates, it shatters. A person spins out of control, devoured by the churning tempest. As I mentioned, there is an intuition that order or law is generally preferable over chaos. Well, this is true when you want to have a highly functioning, advanced society. This is also true when an individual wants to get their life on track. But we also need the explorations into the unknown. We need the surprising and even shocking discoveries. We need a space to doodle and daydream and frolic like a child at play. Even when taken at a societal level, we need people who are open-minded and experimental. New challenges and unforeseen problems come up all the time. The world shifts and changes. Long-term survival and well-being decrease. They decrease substantially for societies that are too rigid, too narrow, that lack the avant-garde innovators and creative, out-of-the-box thinkers. Law versus chaos can be understood as a spectrum. Here's a way to conceptualize it, using natural motifs as metaphors for the different points along the spectrum. We're going to start with extreme law, then go to moderate law, to light law, to neutral, to light chaos, to moderate chaos, to extreme chaos. We start with diamond, representing the absolute or the totalitarian. Then going to stone, which is steadfast or hardened. Wood, disciplined or cultivated. Grass, which is just 
consistent or perhaps obedient. In the neutral middle, we have water. It's impartial or neutral. Then going a little bit into chaos, we have honey. It's messy or indulgent. Smoke, which is drifting or wandering. Then to fire, it is rebellious or even erratic. And lastly, on the extreme end of chaos, we have wind. It's tempestuous or random. On the law versus chaos spectrum, we can find many archetypes and example characters to further embody these characteristics. Chaotic archetypes include the trickster, the rogue, the rebel, the fool, the slacker, the drunkard or drug fiend, the crazed maniac, and the berserker. They are scoundrels and pranksters, renegades and nonconformists, hedonists and wanderers. They follow their own ideas or their whims. They serve their own interests or experimental ideas. Some are even slaves to their all-consuming impulses. Their passions are just too much. It overwhelms them. Some are merely crude or messy. Others are intoxicated, literally or figuratively. Some are provocateurs and instigators. And some hold extreme philosophical views that defy all norms and traditions. Maybe they're an anarchist. Example chaotic characters, specifically chaotic neutral ones that we should all be pretty familiar with, are Conan, Han Solo in A New Hope, Catwoman, Deadpool, Khal Drogo, Sandor Clegane, aka The Hound, Oberyn Martell, Captain Jack Sparrow, Tyler Durden, The Mask, Beetlejuice, and Ferris Bueller. From Dungeons and Dragons, iconic chaotic neutral creatures include the Slod, the Satyr, Kinku, Magman, and the Cyclops. If we combine chaos with morality, this creates the chaotic good alignment. These individuals are unorthodox, they're wild, they're free spirited, even haphazard but they are following their moral conscience. They fight for good, or they at least combat evil, though they probably do so by breaking the rules, and they make these fiercely independent decisions. You might say that they do the right thing, but in the wrong way. Here we see characters like Robin Hood, Indiana Jones, The Hulk, Wolverine, Iron Man, at least the film version of him, Daenerys Targaryen, before the final season, Aladdin, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mary Poppins, and the Three Stooges. From Dungeons and Dragons, iconic chaotic good creatures include the Brass Dragon, Copper Dragon, Fairy Dragon, Pegasus, Storm Giant, and Treant, along with many elves. Blending chaos with malevolence, we have the chaotic evil alignment. Such persons are wild and free, and they do wrong. They selfishly serve their own wishes, regardless of whether it harms others. Some even take pleasure in spreading death, destruction, and mayhem. Chaotic evil really comes down to a total disregard for everything. Disregard for rules, for laws, the sanctity of life itself does not matter. The character just goes with their own impulses and agendas, everything else be damned. Here are characters such as Joker, Carnage, Venom, Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty, the hyenas in The Lion King, Sweeney Todd, Alex from A Clockwork Orange, Freddy Krueger, Wild Bill from The Green Mile, Frank Booth from Blue Velvet, Gozer the Destructor from Ghostbusters, Smog from The Hobbit, Gregor Clegane, aka The Mountain, Joffrey Baratheon, Ramsay Snow, and the majority of classic werewolves. In Dungeons and Dragons, 
Well-known chaotic evil creatures include demons, gnolls, poltergeists, ghouls, hill giants, frost giants, orcs, ogres, and trolls, as well as black dragons, red dragons, and white dragons. On the other end of the spectrum, we find those that are lawful. These individuals value order. Order brings about structure, functioning systems, and habitability. At its best, order provides true peace among people and a stable place from which we can make forays into the unknown, where we can go face the forces of chaos or even evil, learn and gain from the experiences, and then return back to that protected, well-ordered place that is our home. But at its worst, law imposes suffocating tyranny, impossible rules, and harsh rigidity. As we look into lawful characters, it is important to distinguish that a lawful alignment means that the character follows his own concept of what order means. This can certainly be shaped by the society, the government, uh, philosophy, or religion, but it ultimately relies upon the character putting value into said codes or rules and then dedicating himself to maintaining them. In other words, just because you follow the laws of the land doesn't mean that you yourself are lawful aligned. You need conviction, dedication, discipline, self-control, commitment. You need sacrifice in order to really be an embodiment of order. Likewise, a truly lawful character might choose to not follow certain laws of the land or even break them outright if they do not coincide with his own set of codes. Looking at some typical lawful archetypes, we find the judge, the soldier, the monk, the samurai, the wizard, the scholar, the bureaucrat, and the stern monarch. In media, lawful neutral characters are ones such as the Punisher, Judge Dredd, Rorschach, Stannis Baratheon, The Unsullied, Brian Mills from Taken, James Bond, and the Canari from Dragon Age. In Dungeons and Dragons, some classic lawful neutral creatures are Modrons, Myconids, Inevitables, Azers, and Sphinxes. Pairing order and morality creates what is often considered to be the most noble and righteous of all alignments, lawful good, truth, justice, and real freedom comes from this ideal combination. While in many cases there is a strong argument for this, we must keep in mind the two spectrums. So therefore we know that a character could be just a little bit good and a little bit lawful. In actuality, things are complex and quite variable, so we have to dig deeper before just slapping some oversimplified stamp of always the best on this lawful good alignment. It should also be said that, and many others have pointed this out, lawful good does not necessarily mean lawful nice. The forces of righteousness, bearing divine wrath and smiting evil, can be a terrifying thing to behold. Many lawful good characters come quickly to mind. Eddard Stark, Brienne of Tarth, Barristan Selmy, Obi-Wan Kenobi, House Hufflepuff, Atticus Finch, Robocop, Spock, most of the Belmonts from the Castlevania series, Professor X, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, and Captain America in general are closest to lawful good than anything else, though there is a ton of variation depending upon the writer and the series. In Dungeons and Dragons, examples of lawful good creatures are those such as angels, Kirin, Quattles, Unicorns, Flumps, Blink Dogs, Bronze Dragons, Silver Dragons, and Gold Dragons, as well as many Dwarves, 
and halflings. And let's not forget the classic paladin. As we covered just earlier, order can become corrupted. A lawful evil character might take order too far until it becomes oppressive, or perhaps they exploit a system to their own selfish advantage. In other cases, a lawful evil character simply is one that has a well-defined set of personal codes and strategies that they abide by consistently, and these include them hurting people or committing terrible sins and atrocities. Some well-known lawful evil characters are Darth Vader, Tywin Lannister, Roos Bolton, Apocalypse, Doctor Doom, Magneto, the Skeksis, Ra's al Ghul, Don Vito Corleone, Pinhead, and most of the other Cenobites, Mrs. Carmody from The Mist, Predators, Anton from No Country for Old Men, the entire capital in The Hunger Games is basically lawful evil, as are the Reapers from Mass Effect and the Morag Tong and Dark Brotherhood factions from the Elder Scrolls. In Dungeons and Dragons, lawful evil icons include devils, green dragons, blue dragons, beholders, aboleths, hobgoblins, sawagan, kobolds, mummies, oni, githyanki, and mind flayers. At this point, we have to wonder, which is better, law or chaos? It's not as easy to choose as it is with good and evil. Good is objectively better than evil. There are many debates about the concepts of good and evil, and there are some specific cases that really blur the distinction between the two. Imagine, for example, a vigilante killer who murders human traffickers. But in the end, we can all agree that Things which are healthy, helpful, and beneficial are better than things that are harmful and degrading. Law tends to be seen as better than chaos in many cases, but as soon as we really examine it closely, we discover that some kind of balance actually is the best. If you are overly restricted, that's not good. Authoritarian dogmatism that forces itself onto people is not good. On the other hand, if you are disconnected and disoriented, that's not good. If your life is a tumultuous mess and you're sinking in the mire without any stable footing, that's a state of agony. There is suffering at both ends of the law versus chaos spectrum. It's reasonable that a given person is more lawful or more chaotic just due to their personality, their natural interests, and their upbringing and environment. But again, if that person goes too extreme one way or the other, there will be problems. Law and chaos have a relationship to good and evil. One way to describe it is that inappropriate order or chaos leads to evil, while beneficial order or chaos leads to good. For example, if a family puts overbearing rules and overwhelming pressure on its children, this can lead to a form of abuse, and the children will develop disorders, and they'll probably harbor some kind of festering resentment inside of them, and then that's going to go on to cause other problems and harm other people as well. But on the other side of the coin, if a family has too lax of rules and no discipline, that's also bad for the children. They're going to grow up to be immature, narcissistic, disrespectful. They're going to struggle to adapt to the demanding and competitive real world. Going through these delves into alignment has made me wonder what my alignment is. Real world people are very difficult to categorize because actual human beings are so complex. We have many different facets to our personalities, and at times we even hold contradictions within ourselves. 
In general, I would say that I'm neutral good. I probably used to be chaotic good or even chaotic neutral at moments because I was unorganized. I spent a lot of time following my whims and I always seemed to be questioning and defying the structure of the world around me. Over time, I gained some hard earned experience and I grew in knowledge and maturity. I made myself realize the benefits of a more practical and dedicated mindset. Responsibility, hard work, and business skills became much more important to me, even though they're still not my primary strong points. It would be quite difficult for me to ever cross over into the lawful side of the spectrum because in the end, I'm an artist and my creative soul lives for inspiration and dreams and aesthetics and adventure. I like to think that I'm also good aligned. I really do like people. I want to help others in some way. Admittedly, it can be very difficult to do what's right, especially in the short term. The temptation is just so strong to go for the quick, easy pleasures or the bursts of rage that just lets out all your frustration or the selfish momentary gains. And besides all that, the sacrifices that are required for the higher level rewards are so hard, painful, really. It's not easy to say no and to instead focus on deeper, long-term benefits. But it is worth it. I have to admit it, and I have to say this to you all, it is so, so worth it. Destruction is far easier than creation, but creation is greater. After all, any stupid brat can come along and knock over a sandcastle in an instant, but only someone who takes the time and puts forth the effort can build a sandcastle. So I'll leave you with that encouragement. Try to find your balance between law and chaos. And wherever you fall on the spectrum, try to use it for good. Sacrifice what you can of the short-term trivial or even harmful things and focus on developing the long-term meaningful things. You have my hearty clap of motivation. And as always, may your adventures be many.